All of this week, I've been talking about how this widow woman obeyed the word of the prophet, and as she gave, what she gave began to multiply supernaturally. You know, I'd like to speak to you that if God has spoken to you through this, if this ministry has been a blessing to you, then I would encourage you to give, to become a partner with us. Regardless of what the size is, just do something. It's for your benefit. And so I encourage you, when you call or write for these products, also join with us on a monthly basis and become a partner with Andrew Womack Ministries. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. This week, I've just inserted a special week's worth of broadcast based on something that the Lord just recently spoke to me. And from 2 Kings chapter 4, about this widow who didn't have enough money to pay her debt, and so she was going to lose her children. A creditor was going to take them as slaves. And she went to Elisha, and Elisha refused to accept responsibility and just pay for her need out of his the uh, ability. Instead, he pointed her back to the Lord and gave her a promise from, from God about supplying her need. And it not only supplied her temporary need, but it allowed her to live with her children for the rest of her life. And, one, and I've been making a bunch of points from this. But again, let me just say that God spoke this to me. I've got so many things that I'm doing right now, and I'm spending so much money on building these uh, buildings up in Woodland Park that I was praying about things. And the Lord used this to speak to me, just exactly what Elisha said to this woman. He says, what do you have? And you know what? I have more than what I realized. And I went to my staff. We've come up with a number of things, and it's really benefiting us. It's made a huge difference in our ministry. And in the long term, as we walk these things out, I think it's going to make a significant ministry uh, uh, difference in the ministry. But the reason I've been ministering on this this week is because as I prayed about this and I looked at some of the stats and I was thinking about all kinds of things, it just became obvious to me that the majority of people are not really taking a step of faith and taking what they have and pouring it out, believing God to increase them. See, that's what this whole story is about. This woman said, what I have isn't enough. What she had was enough. She just needed to mix it with faith and let God multiply it. And I believe it's the same for every single person watching this program, that you have what you need to prosper and have sufficiency in every single thing. You know, let me read this verse to you out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. It says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Boy, this is a powerful scripture. And it says He's able to make all grace. You know, a little bit of grace is sufficient. But if you think that your situation is so hard that this is even going to be tough for God, God can make all grace abound towards you so that you always, not just every once in a while, but always in every single situation have all sufficiency to abound unto every good work. Not just some, but every good work. The average Christian is not living here. And yet this is what's available to us. And see, to me, this goes right along with 2 Kings chapter 4, where she was saying, what I have isn't enough. And Elisha said, yes, it is. What do you have? Well, all I got's a little bit of oil. If she would act in faith and believe God and do what God said, God would multiply that. And the story is that she had so much oil, she sold it, she paid her immediate debt, and her and her children were able to live the rest of her life on the, on the money that came in through this. Did you know the same thing is true for us? God is able to make all grace abound towards us. But how does this happen? We have to take a step of faith. Did you know when I teach on prosperity and giving, there's a lot of people that just see this as contradictory to the teaching that I do on grace. Because when I'm teaching on grace, I'm saying it's not your holiness, it's not your goodness, it's not the things that you do 
that make you lovely to God. God loves us because He is love and not because we're love, lovely. That He makes everything available to us on the basis of grace, unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor. And some people, when I go to talking about prosperity and that you need to give and you need to trust God, they say, well, see, you're, you're violating your own teaching. Now you've got to give in order to get God to do this. No, you're interpreting this wrong. It says over in Romans chapter 5, verse 2, after the first four chapters of the book of Romans had been talking about it's totally by grace and that God extends everything to us by grace, then it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 2, that we have access into this grace by faith. You access the grace of God by faith. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't get grace as a payment for your actions, but you do have to believe. You have to believe to receive God's grace, or if you doubt, you'll do without. And there's just a million scriptures that go along with this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 says, You're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. You aren't saved by grace alone. God's grace has already been poured out upon the whole earth when Jesus came. He died for the sins of the entire world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. The grace has already been provided. If you don't know Jesus, did you know that your sins have been paid for, but it won't benefit you. You won't be able to access it if you don't get into faith. And faith speaks. It says this in Romans chapter 10, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. See, true Bible faith speaks. As it says in James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. If you say, I believe something, but then you never act on it, it's not a Bible faith. It's just mental assent. It's just acknowledgement that, oh, I, yeah, I acknowledge that that's true. But if you don't act on it, you don't really believe it. You know, if we were sitting in a room and all of a sudden I said, there's a fire, we're going to die if we don't get out of here. And if you just sat there and said, I believe, Andrew, I believe that there's a fire and I'm going to die if I don't move. And you just sat there and did nothing. Well, then you don't really believe it. Now, if you believed it, there would be action, and the actions could vary from person to person. Some people might scream. Some people might faint. Some people might run out and try and escape. Other people might try and put out a fire. But if you really believed that there was a fire and that we were going to die if we didn't get out of there, you would do something. A person who says, oh, I believe it, and yet you take no action, that's not a Bible faith. A Bible faith has to be acted on. Faith without some corresponding action is dead, is what it says in James chapter 2. So it's the same thing with the grace of God. God, by grace, has provided everything you need. 2 Corinthians 9, all grace has abounded towards you so that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. That has already been done, but it doesn't operate in everybody's life. You know why? because they don't mix faith with it. If you understand what I'm saying properly, your giving doesn't cause God to respond to you, but your giving is your positive response to what you believe God has already done. I've been teaching, see, that God provided Adam and Eve's food before He even created them. And when they got hungry, they didn't have to say, oh God, I'm hungry, and then He created food. No, He had already anticipated it but he didn't intravenously just put it into them. They had to reach out and take the fruit. They had to, if it was a banana, peel it. They had to eat it. There were some things they had to do. Did their reaching out and take the fruit make God do it? No, God had already provided it, but if they didn't do something, if they didn't act on what God had already given them, they could have starved sitting right under a fruit tree. They had to do something. God didn't put the food in their mouth and make them automatically eat it. So there is action in the Christian life, but where people have messed up, they thought my action makes God move. No, God moved by grace before you ever had the need. And your action is just your positive response in faith to what He's done. Your actions don't make God do anything. All they do is appropriate what He's already provided. And so if you understand all of this, plug it back into what I've been saying in 2 Kings chapter 4. 
This woman had a need. She first of all looked to some person to meet her need. He wisely redirected her back to the Lord and told her to do something that was completely foolish in the natural. The only reason to do it was because of faith, because she believed God. And so she believed God and she took what she had that most people would have hoarded and said, no, I, I'm not going to let anybody touch this. And she began to pour it out. And when she did, God began to multiply it. And this is what I believe God has said to me, and He specifically challenged me to say to you that, you know what? You need to start pouring out. You need to take a portion of what you've got and you need to start investing it. Again, I'm aware that there's so many people who are going to criticize me and think that my motive about this is all for myself. But I'm, I've received this for myself. I've already implemented it in my own life and in my own ministry. And as I was praying about this and just thanking God for revealing these things to me, He told me that the same thing that works for me will work for you. And I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't challenge you to do this. And I've made this point a couple of times during this week, but the statistics show that there are less than 20% of the people in a typical church who do all of the giving, who do all of these things. The vast majority of people, they might give every once in a while. They tip God every once in a while. This is not what I'm talking about. That kind of attitude where you only give when it's convenient. If you have something left over, you'll give God. But that's not what God asked for. If you go into the Word of God, there's many, many scriptures that talk about the first fruits offering. It calls it the first fruits, not the last fruits, not the leftover fruits, not if there's enough left, I'll give God something fruits. And see, this is the way that the vast majority of people give. I mentioned this earlier, but we have 250,000 people that we communicate with on a monthly basis. And these are people that have contacted us in the last 12 months. If a person doesn't have any contact with us after the initial contact after 12 months, we quit mailing to them because apparently they don't want our materials or whatever. And that's just a decision that we've made for stewardship. So these 250,000 people are people that have been current within the last 12 months. And out of those, we have about 32,000 people who are monthly partners, people who give either something on a regular basis or we consider people who give over $360 a year, even if it's a one-time gift, we consider them a partner. They just gave it all at one time. So that's the criteria we use. And out of these 250,000 people, we only have 32,000 people that have given on a monthly basis or have given a significant amount. That means that I guess that's what, 78% or maybe 77% of all of, the, or no, excuse me, 87%, 87% of all of the people who we minister to on a regular basis don't give anything on a regular basis. Now again, you could give somewhere else and that's fine. I'm not saying that I'm the only place that you can give. That's between you and the Lord. But I just know from dealing with people, looking at statistics, that it's not just that people are giving somewhere else. The vast majority of people do not give where they're fed. This is what it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. It says, if we've sown to you spiritual things, is it a big thing if we reap your financial or physical material things? You know, the obvious answer to this is no. In other words, you're supposed to give where you're fed. You don't go into McDonald's and then walk across the street and pay Wendy's for what you got at McDonald's. Again, I'm not saying this for my benefit. I'm saying it for your benefit about how you need to start giving. And you can give wherever you want to. You need to give someplace. But if you're watching this program and if you're being blessed, you should be giving. And you know what? It'd be easy for me just to ignore this and go on because God has raised up people and praise God, we're making it and we're getting by. I could use a lot more money than I've got, but I'm going to make it with or without you. I really believe that. I believe that God is my source and if you don't respond and do what you need to do, God's going to get it to me somewhere else. But for your benefit, I'm saying that you need to give. Elisha could have ministered to this woman and met her need, but he needed her to take a step of faith. He gave her something. He told her to take what she had and begin to give it away, pour it out. 
And that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to do this for your benefit. I tell you, it's, it's for your benefit. And these verses, you know, over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 is where I just read. Then in verse 10, it says, God gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. God gives seed. You know, the seed here isn't really talking about a physical seed. It's using a physical seed to describe money. If you were to take 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, every verse in those two chapters are talking about money. You can read it in its context and see it. I'm not taking it out of context. It's talking about money. And it says it compares money to a seed. Because when you take money and give it, it's like sowing seed and you will receive back an abundant harvest. In Mark chapter 10, verse 30, it says that any person who's left house, father, mother, brother, sister, lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold in this life with persecutions and in the world to come everlasting life. You'll receive a hundredfold in this life. You'll re if you give physical things, you will receive physical things in this life. That's what the Lord is promising. He's using seed to illustrate money that is given because just like a seed, when you plant a seed, it doesn't leave your life. It just grows and multiplies and comes back to you in an increased form. When you give with the right attitude, money's not leaving your life. It's coming back to you. It's in the future, not the distant future, eternity in this life, but you will receive it back a hundredfold in this life. And I'm telling you, I just, this is the way that I live. I personally have taken this. I've started giving. I, we started doing all kinds of things. And the Lord just spoke to me that, you know what, the only reason I wouldn't share this with the people watching my television audience is because of the criticism that I know many of you all have against me and I know the things you do. But if I, if I wasn't afraid of men and if I wasn't afraid of people's response, I need to tell you this because these are things God has told me. I've received benefit from it. I'm acting on it. And I believe that the Lord is saying the same thing to you. There are many of you watching this program that have been blessed for decades and yet you've never given. And you know what? There's, there's people, and again, I'm not saying this for my benefit. I'm just saying it for yours, trying to get this point across. There are some of you that go to these dead churches I mean dead churches, churches that have uh, just a social gospel. They ordain homosexuals and call them as ministers and they, they aren't preaching the gospel. They aren't standing up for the Word of God. And you go there and you put your money into that church and yet you get fed through this program, maybe through other programs, through books, CDs, and that's how you're living. In a sense, what you're doing is bootlegging the gospel. You're getting fed here, but you're paying somewhere else. And again, you know what? God's going to take care of me. So I'm going to make it with or without you. But for your benefit, I'm telling you that that's not right. And somebody is saying, but it doesn't matter where I give. God just sees my heart and understands. It does matter where you give. You'd make a sorry farmer if you just take your seed and go plant it on, on concrete. You aren't going to have the same results as if you put it in fertile soil. Where you plant it, the better the soil, the better the return you get off of it. And plus, even not even talking about the return that you get, but did you know that when you give, you are in a sense saying to the person that you give to, I like it. I like it. Do it again. And when you give to somebody who's not preaching the gospel and stuff like this, did you know that you are encouraging them? And that's not right. You need to give. If We could solve so many problems if Christians would just give where they're fed. If for some reason you're in a church that doesn't feed you, you know, the first thing you ought to do is get out of that church. You ought to go to one that does feed you and then you put your tithes into that church. I'm good with that. I'm not a church. I don't want your tithes. But if for whatever reason you find yourself going to a church that doesn't preach the gospel, or it's not preaching the true gospel. It's just religious. You shouldn't be putting your tithes into that church. 
And if you're having to go to me and other ministers and stuff to be fed, then you ought to give where you're fed. Now, again, I believe that you should be putting your tithe into the local church because the local church can meet your needs in a way that I can't. You know, if you get sick in the middle of the night, you can call my helpline and you can have people here that'll pray with you and stuff like that. But I'm not going to be available to come over to your house. I'm not going to be able to mar marry and bury people. I'm not going to be able to dedicate your children. I'm not going to be able to counsel you. You need a local church, people that can minister to you in a way that a ministry like mine never can. But if for whatever reason you aren't in a church like that, you should not be putting your tithes into that local church. The Bible says to bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. What's a storehouse? It's where your food is. It's where you keep your food. You go there to get some food. In other words, you, you need to bring the tithes into where you're fed. You ought to be going to a church that feeds you, and then you use offerings above your tithe. But if for whatever reason, if you know your great-grandma had her name inscribed on the pew, and because of that, you're going to stay there regardless of whether they're preaching the gospel or not. Whatever your reason is, if you go to a church that's not preaching the gospel, don't put your tithes into it because you're encouraging it. Do you know, if we gave where we were fed, the people who are preaching the true gospel would have an abundance. And the people who are charlatans and crooks and selling snake oil and doing all of the things that they do to get people to support them, would dry up and blow away. They'd either have to get right and start preaching the true gospel or they wouldn't have anybody support them. And yet, sad to say, most people give where they're begged. And again, just for the point of, just for trying to illustrate and make the point I'm, I'm making here, we have the potential of, if 1% of the potential people who can view this program watch, that would be 3.2 Mil, or let's see. No, that'd be 32 million people. 1% uh, of 32, uh, 3.2 billion people. Let me get this right. 3.2 billion people watch, can watch my program. If only 1% watched, that would be 32 million people. And you know, if 32 million people just sent in a dollar, any time that God blessed them and spoke to them and if they got something and if they just sent in a dollar, man, what would it be like if I got $32 million a day? I guarantee it would it'd be no limit to the things we could do. But see, most people don't give where they're fed. They give where they're begged. They give where there's something. If you don't give, we're going to have to go off. We're going to have to do this. And most people give emotional giving when their heartstrings have been touched. I'm just trying to tell you like this woman, I'm saying like Elisha did, what do you have? Everybody's got a little bit of money. You need to be sowing it. Amen. If not into this ministry, into some ministry, you need to become a monthly partner. You know, we're out of time, but I do have a new teaching on this. If you'll listen, our announcer will give you some information about that. And I encourage you to respond, to get the material, and also to partner with us or with someone today. Start sowing that seed today.